Hey, perfect. So uh, this panel is now about the, the actuality of Bergson uh, and well, Paul Antoine will moderate. Uh, so we have uh, two uh, presentation uh, and now we start by uh, Gregorio Tanti. Uh, Gregorio is a PhD student at the University of Gen Genoa in Italy and he works on philosophical morphology, romantic aesthetics and bioaesthetics. He has published a book on Simondo's biophilosophy, exploring the idea of aesthetical morphogenesis. And he's preparing a book about Friedrich, well, it's hard to pronounce in English, especially Schleyer Mascher's aesthetic thoughts. Uh, and today he'll uh, talk to us about the entomology in Bergson. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to all the organizers. I try to share my my screen too. There it is. If you can see it. Okay. So uh, my presentation starts from the Bergsonian scene of the hunting wasp and the caterpillar appearing in the second chapter of Creative Evolution as an opportunity to think with uh, Bergson. Uh, this passage presents us with a scene of absolute alterity, taken from what seems the most distant domain of the living, most resistant to anthropomorphic projections, the insect world, and considers this uh, famously gruesome story as an important example of environmental wisdom. If there is an implicit ecology in creative evolution, I think it starts here, from this uh, telluric and apparently even mystical manifestation of life itself. I believe we are all acquainted with uh, Bergson's theory of instinct and its relations with uh, Jean-Henri Fabre's uh, observations. I will underline just a few elements of Bergson's reflection. Bergson says that the clim in the climax of the hunt, the wasp and its prey are brought into each other's presence, and I quote, no longer as organisms, but as activities, end of quote. Since the prey does not represent an object to the hunter, but the direction of a same vital flux, their encounter takes place in absence of any transitive operation, be it perceptible logic or mechanic. The wasp already finds itself in the same ontological space as its prey. Their uh, reciprocal uh, influence presupposes a kind of sympathetic cohesion a specific ontological space of the, the variations. When instinctual behavior dominates, as in Hymenoptera, perception is uh, subordinated to the haptic vision of fluxes, which Bergson compares to musical themes. Instinct allows a vision from within. Um, along the lines of the environment, environmental texture, Bergson uh, clearly suggests that this kind of consciousness belongs not just to animals, but to the living in general. And I quote, the instinct that animates the bee is indistinguishable then from the force that animates the cell or is only a prolongation of that force. In extreme cases like this, instinct coincides with the work of organization, end of quote. So the problem with instinct is the following. If life is essentially genesis uh, and instinctual behavior is fixed, immutable, how is instinct an expression of life, not a mechanism? Or in the terms of instincts and institutions by Deleuze, how does instinct create the conditions of satisfaction of the drive? Bergson uh, uh, begins to answer by comparing instinctual behavior and the formative force of living matter. Just like the cell, uh, the animal finds itself integrated in a transitional space and changes together with its system, which is always a semantically qualified territory. Uh, the times of these changes are of course geological compared to human times. The plasticity of instinct is too subtle for the criteria of intelligence because it works through continuous variations instead of molar discontinuities. It is what Bergson calls a difference of rhythm, a slowness that leads us to treat natural entities as things. 
from this viewpoint, variability is not an issue, for instance. Uh, environmental cohesion is not the same as immutable, immutable predetermination. Much like intelligent knowledge, instinct can be wrong, tricked, and holds a certain amount of uh, virtuality and plasticity. But whereas intelligence receives and abstracts uh, contingencies from the environment, instinct generates its own conditions, making itself as it exists. Intelligence makes use of laws, while instinct obeys to self-imposed norms. Its creativity does not reside in a faculty of absolute deviance, but in its expressive spontaneity. So Bergson's theory of instinct can be specified in the, in the sense I have just set out, uh, I hope. And it is also fruitful, in my opinion, to look at the interpretation offered by uh, Raymond Rouillère. In his article on uh, Bergson et la Sphère Saint 1959, Rouillère says that by instinct, Bergson means something broader, that is, the instinct of the embryo itself. That is to say, life in the form of a primary non-representational consciousness. The instinctual consciousness navigates a territory following a web of semantic trails. Uh, the territory itself consists in this semantic texture. The trails can be understood as musical themes, and this is an image that Rier takes from Bergson. Each of these themes uh, is an element of material expressiveness. Uh, the metaphor of musical themes is very literal. A musical theme is a unified field of relations in which the whole is present in every part as it constructively unfolds itself. And the unification is therefore expressive, not presided by any totalizing representation. It's the tensive process of a multiplicity. Uh, it is highly doubtable, says uh, Rouyer, that instinct uh, ex excludes perception, as Bergson thinks. But what Bergson meant and Rear confirms is that the external stimuli do not function as mechanic causes, but as expressive attractors. While reflex is a mechanical juxtaposition of stimulus and immediate response, uh, instinct is an ecological enmeshment of perception action, it marks uh, an autonomy and involves awareness. Simplifying a little, we can say that the mechanic movement, movement is a continuous behavior of discontinuous parts, while a development is a discontinuous behavior of continuous parts. Um, instinct then consists in a sort of non-anthropomorphic consciousness. Uh, I believe it is a, an important ecological principle to hold with Bergson that intelligence and instinct are parallel, not subsequent, instinct does not prelude to intelligence, but they are also clearly in close relation. Uh, Rier defines instinct as a psychic uh, automatism, and I find it very interesting considering that Bergson's famous example of swimming as a whole and simple act is indeed an example of psychic automatism, just like walking. Uh, in an automatic act, uh, a consciousness is a plastic and immanent activity integrated with a specific environment. I would like to focus on this notion of automatism, a notion that is uh, usually rejected by both Bergson and Rouyer as a mechanicist notion. Rouyer, for instance, was a fierce opposer of uh, cybernetics, which he saw as the latest version of modern dualism. But another French biophilosopher belonging to a different generation, Gilbert Simondon, uh, realized that the philosophical meaning of cybernetic uh, lay precisely in shifting the focus from the structural being to the formative activity and behavior. Some recent interpretations have also specified the manifold significance of the notion of automatism in relation to Bergson's uh, vitalism. And I'm referring above all to the works by Federico Leoni. So, Unlike mechanisms, an automatism is a live formation, an axiological whole uh, dictated by an activity, uh, a complex behavior which exists before a being intended as a structure. The activity is not triggered from the outside, but constitutes uh, a spontaneous whole of singular activities. 
For example, the agencement of wasp and caterpillar is the interaction of two activities that realizes itself as a material mobilization. Uh, staking in an automatic becoming, an individual does not possess a consciousness. Uh, it is immediate consciousness and pure agency. In this sense, a formative act is the realization of a genetic law inscribed in an environment. If it forms an individual, it is, and I quote, uh, a perfect individuality that lacks nothing, uh, a, end of quote, a unitas multiplex, as we are defines it. Uh, a form which is not abstract and possible of application, but virtual and compelled to expression. Rouillère's reflection offers interesting tools to reactivate Bergson's insights. There are, of course, uh, some differences between Rouillère and Bergson, but I believe their philosophical starting point to be the same. It is the live matter in the protoplasmic or proto-individual form. In the perspective described so far, materiality is pure activity, even though uh, at different intensities. Matter is resistance and obstacle only for intelligence. Uh, it is interiorly known instead by instinct. While intelligence dissolves the ontological specificity of matter by representing it, instinct or primary consciousness uh, subjectifies matter. And matter becomes alive, that is uh, spontaneously plastic and capable of behavior. So far, I have sketched out a possible way to deepen Bergson's monistic vitalism through Rouillère and the notion of automatism. Uh, the introduction of this last notion seems authorized by Canguillem's uh, well-known statement on Bergson's biological mechanism, with, uh, which I quote in the slide. Now, I find less fruitful to see Bergson's biological mechanisms uh, as an organology, uh, as Canguillem does. And now I would like to develop this claim. In my opinion, it is more difficult to follow Bergson when he connects uh, instinct to embodied techniques. Here it looks like he falls in an ancient rhetoric concerning the insect world, a rhetoric that dates back to the 18th century naturalist debates. The idea according to which insects would offer an example of proto-technical elaboration of the environment through bodily means, that is, uh, in absence of externalized instruments. This anthropomorphic imagery is still at work in Bergson. Uh, instinct and intelligence are, and I quote, uh, solutions to the same problem, two different methods of action on inert matter, end of quotation. Even though making a stark distinction between fabrication and organic techniques, uh, Bergson argues for a fundamental transitivity between organ and instrument. But organology is an anthropological matter, insofar as it refers to the origins of a separation from the environment. It is the hand, typically, the, the organ that evolves into a universal instrument. Animals, in this regard, don't act like human beings. So Bergson's argument is at least slippery. On an interpretative level, we should emphasize that uh, instinct treats matter as live and endowed with intrinsic forms. Bergson does not go far in describing how we can conceive of this behavioral affinity with matter. My aim here is to begin to explore such kind of affinity. And what is at stake is the possibility of thinking of a non reifying a non-dominating uh, doing of strategies aimed at a symmetry between individuals and territory. Now, exploring this possibility entails two symmetrical operations, uh, vivification of matter and the materialization of the living behavior, becoming matter of the living. One strategy inspired from certain insect behaviors is that of dispossession. Uh, I take this concept from uh, uh, Mimetisme Psychasthenie Legendaire by Roger Caillois, 
who famously claimed that phenomena like those of mimicry, disguise, camouflage, and organic ornament represent processes of assimilations, assimilation sorry, to the material surroundings. An insect in an apparent act of responding to the other's eye is actually captured by a semantically oriented territory. Space devours and replaces individuality and activates itself through it. Kayua agrees with Bergson that it is a kind of enchantment of uh, immaterial semantic cohesion, but uh, considers it as an involutionary instinct that has nothing to do with an evolutionary economy. I quote, life takes a step back, end of quotation. Uh, Kayua thesis uh, can be generalized. All communication among insects can be understood as phenomenon of materialization. Uh, insect constructions are the materialization of the world of meanings that insects live in and that they ultimately are. To exchange signs at this level means to immerse themselves in a territory of material correspondences. As claimed by Giorgio Prodi, there is a logica materialis that irreducibly precedes human intentionality and whose primit fact, primitive fact is interaction. Becoming matter then is not a process of self-objectivation or self-objectification, but the material activation of a space of sense. This takes us to the second strategy, which is the most typical collective insect behavior, the swarm, very popular in contemporary debates. A swarm of marching locusts or nest building ants is an emergent phenomenon of collective motion where individuals from form a self-organizing system that behaves autonomously and takes unpredictable configurations. This behavior can be described as material uh, resembling more of a lava flow, for example, than a single living agent. The distinction here runs between homogeneous materials which tend to hide their capacity of self-organization and uh, heterogeneous or metastable materials, which tend to express a capacity of self-organization. So not only insects live in a world of active matters, they also act like living matter. Behavior emerges from the creation of bonds and kinships and from the integration with the dynamic multiplicity of a territory. I have focused on collective or social manifestation and communicative dynamics, something that Bergson mentions in Creative Evolution without giving it much attention. But, and these are my final remarks, uh, every encounter, such as the hunt of the wasp and the caterpillar, is a semiotic event. It is between at least two reciprocal activities, or in any case, within an environmental space of activities that a behavior takes place and an automatic and living coordination arises. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You, you know that uh, in, in Toulouse, you have uh, uh, one specialist of, of stigma and of collective behavior. And uh, the, name, the name of the guy is um, Guy Terolaz. Thank you. You, you could be. No, I didn't know. By its paper. Okay. So, some questions? Actually, uh, for Antoine, uh, we, we do the questions at the end. Ah, at the end, okay. Of the, there is, because there is a second person talking. Okay, okay, fine. Uh, which is uh, Paco uh, Magic Burgerer. Uh, so after studies in evolutionary biology in Uruguay, he moved to Japan, where he did research on developmental biology, studying regeneration of echinoderms. And he started the PhD in 2017 at ETH Zurich. And his research, his research mainly focuses on molecular evolvability, on genetic novelty, gene regulation, and how development allows for the exploration of the space of genetic possibilities. And today he's going to talk to us about Bergson's Elan Vital and contemporary molecular evolutionary biology. 
can I share the screen? Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, hello, thank you for organizing. Uh, as a clarification, I'm a biologist, not a philosopher, so uh, bear with me. Uh, so first, uh, I want to say thank you to Benj ben Benjamin, because he already introduced this idea of, of what was happening in the time uh, around evolutionary theory when, when Bergson published Create Evolution, no? There were all these different um, interpretations of how evolution could happen, especially in what has to do with heredity and how variation ar arises, no? And Bergson had a problem with each of them. Um, because uh, all of them kind of had a, like, uh, kind of had a mechanicistic under undertone, uh, which uh, he seeks to remedy with the incorporation of his Elan Vital in, in, in kind of like, which is kind of like a, this informed concept based on in the empirical data of how it is that the new, new forms are created as, as, as time uh, passes by. Um, so I want to, to speak about mainly what were the changes since uh, in evolutionary theory um, since the publication of, of Creative Evolution. Uh, also, Joel has already spoken about like the evolutionary synthesis, and you are right, uh, mainly. Uh, but I think I, I want to focus more on what happened in, in, in the context of molecular evolution. Uh, when Watson and Crick um, published their paper on the structure of DNA, um, you, we could say like this molecular evolution started, right? We understood how, how it was that the uh, uh, inherited information, the, the information that is inherited from one organism to the next is kind of saved in, 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 a, uh, in a material. Uh, and since then, we started to understand much better how it is that those genes uh, that are in the DNA are utilized by biological organisms. Uh, one of the key mo uh, moments for this uh, understanding came from the discovery of gene regulation by Jacob and Monod. Uh, the, the elucidation of the genetic code, uh, which taught us how it is that DNA informs the the production of proteins, which are the, the effectors in, in cells, basically. Uh, and then I, I would say that the first uh, convergence between evolutionary theory and molecular biology came uh, with a neutral theory of molecular evolution from Kimura in 68, which um, described most change that happens at the level of, of, of the genes as neutral as having no effect on, on, on the organism, but rather staying there silent uh, in, the, in the DNA. Then in the 80s, there was this interesting um, discovery of, of Hox genes, which are genes that are very important for defining body parts in animals. Uh, and that kind of like kick-started the, the whole field of evolution and development, which is, nowadays very very big and then in the middle of the 90s and eventually like with the publication of the human genome in in early 2000s uh, we kind of entered the genomic era uh, which allowed us to kind of basically know what is the dna sequences of whatever we want at this point because the the technologies are super advanced and within this context there's also the idea of transcriptomics which is not just like we don't know only what is the genomic sequence, but also how it is that that genomic information is being used in cells, okay? Uh, during this time, Bergson's ideas, uh, at least within biology or, or, or mainstream biology, were not so taken into account, I would say, at least to my knowledge. Uh, here, for example, we have this quotation from one of the main, um, proponents of, of the, the evolutionary thesis, like the, the neo-Darwinian by excellence, which is Ernst Mayer, who um, says that the Elan Vital is not an explanation to anything, and that he will not waste any time showing how all these attempts to explain evolution were. Uh, and he 
um, say that although some observations that they make are the, that these uh, like people like Verson make are correct, um, the supernaturalistic conclusions are are misleading. And then uh, Mathilde already mentioned this quote from Monod, um, where he says that Verson has a lot of poetry, but not so much logic. He also refuses to discuss it, discuss his his ideas. Uh, not uh, because he doesn't feel capable, because he, he thinks in a different way. And in spite of that, he doesn't, doesn't think that his ideas are insignificant. And that if he had used a, a deeper language that is less clear, uh, they would still be discussed to, to, to his day when he published La Sala de um, So my question is, was Berson too clear as, as Monos is? Um, and I think by that he means he was too spiritual. He was using too, too much of this uh, metaphysical words that would repel some scientists. Was he too uh, anthropocentric? Like also scientists would, some biologists would not like that. Um, and was his thesis too supernaturalistic as Mayer had said? So I would say that this idea of supernaturalism and this would be addressing the, the first Bergson that Mathilde was talking about could actually be like kind of sort of reinterpreted with some of the knowledge we have gathered with the molecular revolution. Uh, so I will especially talk about a few theoretical frameworks that are used uh, to this day in evolutionary theory. One of them being the idea of the genotype space and the mutations that play on it. Uh, the idea of development or also understood as the idea of the, how the genotype transformed into a phenotype and the idea of, of evolution and tinkering. Okay. So I will use examples and, and, and animal pictures. So let's imagine that we have this gray fish here and, and the grayness of this fish is defined by these three nucleotides in the, in the genome of the fish. Then this fish can mutate through so point mutations uh, to the adjacent frac uh, sequences, right? So here we can mutate the, the middle letter, the G, and we can go to A, to C, or to T. Uh, and now let's consider that if, if the C is in the middle, then that defines that the fish becomes red. And then we have another subset of this space that is defining the redness of the fish. So it's kind of defining this phenotype. Uh, we can also think that maybe in, if instead of, of, of having this being in this region of this space, the fish is in this other region, the fish is then green. Um, if it has these two T's at the beginning of this sequence. So we can see evolution as a sort of exploration of this space. This is very much linked to, to Wright's landscape that was mentioned before. before. Uh, but here we're just talking about limitations, no adaptiveness there. Uh, and sometimes it can happen that within this landscape, you can jump from one point to the other through special mutations that are not the point mutations, but we will disregard them. So one thing that, that is known nowadays with all the molecular advances that we have is that uh, there are mutational biases. There are some mutations that are more likely to happen than others. For example, in this example, um, if the second mutation, if it's easier to turn into a T, then we will likely have the evolutionary path of the fish going towards becoming green rather than becoming red, red because the, the mutation towards T is more likely to happen. So it stays away from the red and goes toward the green. It is also the case that we have different mutation rates. So some of these positions could change more quickly than others. And there's also mutational hotspots that are genomic regions that change very fast. Uh, so for example, it could also be the case that if we change primarily in, in the first position, then we are more likely to end up uh, far away from where we started, okay? Uh, second fundamental um, uh, concept in, in, in what I want to say is the idea of development. And that is how this genotype is transformed into the, 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 the phenotype, which is the redness of the fish in this case. So the central dogma of molecular evolution is that we have the DNA, the TCC in this case, that gets transcribed into a messenger RNA that gets translated into a protein that then produces the redness of the, of the, of the fish in this case. Uh, but now going to the discoveries of Jaco and Monod, uh, we have gene regulation. So the, the, this TCC is not alone in the cell. There's so much more, the, the genome is huge. And we can have other regions of the genomes that are in charge of taking care of the expression of TCC. So here in this case, GGG, GGA would 
kind of interfere with the production of this red protein at whatever scale of, the, of that production. And that will make the fish go gray instead of red. And this can of, of course happen at the level of within the cell, but it can also happen at the level of the whole organism between different cells that are telling each other what they have to do, how they have to coordinate their behavior. And this can also happen at the level of, of interactions with the environment through phenotypic plasticity. For example, if there is a predator, you don't want to be red because they can see you more easily. So maybe you can, if you have some way of sensing the predator, you can shut off this system uh, for becoming red and you become gray. And if there's no predator, the opposite. And then there's also the, the interesting idea of noise, which is very recent because it's, it can be studied well with, with all these new technologies that study the, the, the working of genes in individual cells. Uh, so all these processes that I'm talking about, they're not super precise. So there could also always be some fluctuation if one of them that would make uh, the fish become gray or red depending on, on, on some stochastic uh, behaviors within cells and um, within the embryo or within the whatever condition. And an important idea concerning all this network of, uh, of, 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 of this machinery within, within the cell is uh, that you can fine tune different biological processes by changing uh, how it is that you pro produce this, this protein. And here's where uh, Jacob's evolution and, and tinkering comes, comes into play. He was saying that most of biological change will happen through this fine tuning of, of these different processes that could have big effects without actually altering the fundamental integration of the whole organism. So there's all this, this his evolutionary history that built an organism to be integrated in a way. Uh, you can fine tune some things without disrupting the whole, the whole system. And something that derives from this is this idea of the virtuality of this genotype, right? Because this genotype, what, what it does is basically it contains all this potential information that can be used in different ways, depending on many circumstances, internal to the cell, external to the whole organism as well. Uh, during development, it happens that all these cells start to get coordinated and many shut a lot of genes off, even though they have the potential to use them, they don't. Um, so the, in ACT, there's only a few set of genes that are used in, in, in different time points of the development of the fish. And that is starting to get us closer to, to the Bersonian terms. So let's imagine that we have, so also another important point is like, I'm, I'm simplifying this to these three letters, but in actual, organisms, it's billions of them. In the human genome is 3 billion of these letters. And therefore the space of combinations of different mutations, it, it's, it's, it's nearly infinite, I would say. And let's say that in this exploration of this space, this, you have, we start with this gray fish that it can go to these different um, directions. Uh, let's say that the upper one kills a fish. It, 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 it doesn't allow the function, the correct functioning of the fish. Then the fish can go in the other two directions. And then given this kind of like wobbling space that I was talking about because of noise, because of the interaction with the environment, because of whatever else, uh, the fish can sometimes become red. Uh, and sometimes in, in the other one, it can die. In ACC, AAC, it can die and AGC, it can become red occasionally. And then evolution will start to like, kind of like natural selection will start to act on the ones that can potentially become red. Uh, so here it's um, related to, to this idea of natural selection as, um, as, a, as a force that kind of keeps the exploration within some, some sort of like um, uh, like a frontier, like in, within some borders. Uh, and then the, the fish can mutate and still become red and then it increases in, in the in the fitness and it's still continuous following its evolutionary history of how it is that its exploration happens towards, for example, becoming red or to dying if, if it follows the wrong path. And what I would say uh, to use Bergsonian terms, uh, terms is that by containing this drift away from what, does, from what does work, natural selection helps build this memory, this integration of the parts that shouldn't be disrupted or you fall apart like this red fish there with the TPA. 
and so I would say that this, uh, I don't want to like describe the Lambital because it's like uh, an image, you know, that I learned that today, uh, not a precise definition, but I would like to like say how these views of molecular evolution um, kind of like can help describe some of the process that person allocates to this Elan. And, and I think one of them is this directionality. Uh, with with the ex this example of the fish that I was describing, I, I think it, it fits perfectly into this description that Berson does. There is finalism because life does not act without directions, uh, but there is no end because these directions are not pre-existing. They are rather created along the act that goes through them. So as the fish is evolving, as it is like accumulating this memory of the things that worked before and get integrated into all these molecular networks and processes, mainly processes, not so much networks, uh, uh, then the new possible ways evolution can follow are defined. Uh, and then I would like to talk about this, this idea of um, the, virtu the virtual to the, and the actualization and the consciousness. Here's this uh, quote in, from the Lewis's book comparison. Evolution is carried out from the virtual to the actuals. Evolution is actualization, actualization is creation. And I would say that this actualization is this transition from the genotype, from this information, all this potential, all this virtual, uh, virtual information that is contained in the DNA uh, or whatever other mechanism of inheritance uh, that gets actualized, actualized into the phenotype, which is matter in, in a way. It's, it's a, a, a form of matter. And I would say that all these processes, all these connections that could happen that can react different ways between each other within the organism, but also relative to the environment, it gives um, a degree of freedom to what it is, the, the production of the, the, the development of the organism. Uh, there is a molecular freedom, if you want, within these two layers of the genotype to the phenotype um, as it is constructed. So to finish, uh, I will just kind of like try to build this connection between these uh, biological and Bergsonian terms. One is that mutations, uh, they lead on different paths of the space of possibility. Those mutations modify the memory of past successes. So um, in each instant, uh, each organism has a genome, that genome gets modified by mutations uh, and it's creating a new, a new virtual, a new information, which is like, okay, this memory or genotype, however you want to call them, they are virtual. Uh, that memory is actualized into matter, the matter that corresponds to the organism, not to the matter that is an obstacle to evolution, but the one that is internal to, like the, the one the Elan uses to express itself. Uh, through the genotype phenotype maps, the genotype phenotype map leave room for, for this freedom. And the phenotypes encounter environmental matter. I would like to draw the distinction again. And the new virtual genotypes are then permitted to persist in the memory of successful branches of life. Okay, that's, that's my presentation. I hope it wasn't too biological or whatever. Many, many thanks. So that's time for a question now, if, if I understand well, Mathilde. Is it correct? Yes? Yes, it's correct. Thank you for this uh, terrific presentation, Paco. <laughs> So some questions. I have a lot of questions. If yeah. <laughs> no, there, there, is a... <laughs> there was there was a question before which I yeah. put in the chat. Ah from yeah yeah okay okay, Mays. okay okay where let me see Jonathan Mays, could you go into the concept of noise? I am interested in the role such a concept plays in genetic research. Is it just an undefined rest of that which affects the phenotype? but is not defined precisely, or is it something more precise? Okay, sure. It is a lot of ongoing research on the subject, and most of it is theoretical. Uh, and it has to do with, with 
uh, I mean, you could also in a way say that mutations, for example, mutations in our body in the soma are a sort of noise. It, it, it depends on how, how you define it. But I, the main, the, the one I was referring to was mostly the one that has to do with uh, the noise of, for example, how much of a gene product you produce, which, and, and there are many biological processes that kind of like, if you reach a level of criticality in like the certain concentration of, of a product, then it triggers uh, a, a, the formation of a phenotype, for example, like a pattern formation of like a, the, the stripes of a, of a zebra fish, it's the classic example. Uh, so that is the, the, the concept that I was talking about. Like uh, if you are not fine tuned enough, so evolution can, you can evolve systems to reduce this noise so that you don't escape towards other paths that are not that the ones that worked before. But you can also leave, like let uh, the molecular systems not be so precise so that you can sometimes use this um, spectrum of great of possibilities that this noise gives you. I don't know if that was clear enough. I can recommend literature on the subject. So another question, Bruno. So you can speak. Okay, okay. I have a question for Gregorio, and uh, uh, actually two questions. Thank you for the presentation. Was is it such an interesting topic, and not well developed uh, among uh, Bergsonians. So the first question is, uh, I want to know you. I want to know if uh, how do you, do you understand the reason why Bergson divides so dramatically instinct and intelligence? I know that it's based on his definition of life of how, of how life develops. But uh, do you think that maybe it has to do with some anthropomorphic reasons to put man in a special place in a way? I, I remember this uh, whole discussion between uh, uh, among British um, uh, psychologists uh, like Lloyd Morgan and other figures that they really they were uh, sympathetic of Bergson's definition of, of, of instinct, but they're, they're really critical towards this uh, differentiation, uh, radical differentiation between instinct and, and, and uh, intelligence. So that's my first question. And my second question is if, if I, uh, I, I would like you to develop more the, at the end of your presentation, you said something about uh, the semiotic aspect of instinct. But if you, if you, if you get the, if you read the Huyer's uh, critique of Bergson's uh, position, um uh, it's precisely because he's stating the that it, it, he's criticizing this this uh, division between instinct and, and intelligence but also he's criticizing uh the, the concept of organization and also he's, he's saying that the main characteristic of intelligence of intelligence is not uh given by the hand by the technical by technical inventions but by symbolic action, constitution of symbolic action. So how do you see, because that, Bergson has a really weird uh, uh, position if you compare him to another uh, 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 nat naturalist. So how do you see this question of Hoyer's critiques? So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the questions. Uh, so uh, as regards the uh, distinction, Bergson makes uh, between in instinct and intelligence. I think um, it's uh, because he wants to. I'm not an expert of uh, Bergson's uh, evolutionary uh, perspective uh, and his criticisms uh, of uh, Darwin, etc. But uh, I'm, I think he wants to say uh, instinct is not the uh, primitive phase of intelligence. Uh, and it, uh, it doesn't evolve into intelligence. Um, and so um, there is no uh, direction from instinct to intelligence, but I might be wrong. And anyway, he understands very well the relations between the two uh, worlds. And uh, he, he says uh, they, they are never pure in, uh, in nature. Um, and so Mm, I don't know if you agree uh, on this. And um, as regards this, your second question, 
Uh, yes, I think the main distinction runs between uh, uh, representation and, and presentation, if you want to, um, to say it with, uh, with Rouillère. Uh, so um, both uh, primary and secondary consciousness or uh, non-representational and representational consciousness uh, are uh, semiotic in a way. Uh, but um, there, is a, there is a difference between presenting something and representing something. And so um, symbolism comes from uh, a um, logica materialis, uh, something that uh, a, a natural semiosis that uh, precede, uh, precedes um, human semiosis. Um, and that's very evident in stigmergy and all these kinds of um, phenomena. Um, there is a differential continuity between um, non-representational and representational semiosis, but um, there is also a, specific, a specificity of the two. I don't know if uh, I answered you. Yes, apparently. <laughs> So another question, Bruno? No, okay. So, Thank you. Uh, here a question, question from Letizia Cipriani. Thank you for your presentation. In your opinion, generally, it would be possible to define durée as a form of continuous mutation. I think the question is for Paco. Considering Bergsonian notions such as variation, alteration of nature, qualitative. So uh, is there some link between duration and the continuous mutation? I, I would I would say so. In in the way of I am like the way I interpret the duration, yes. I was actually like practicing this presentation with a friend and, and he had a different opinion of what duration was. So I left that out. But uh, as I understand it, uh, yes, it, it is this this change of the memory, no, like the mutation, what it does is like um it it you have a genome and when you pass it to the next generation, um, you incorporate it in that memory of, of, of that what that was the, 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 the virtual information that, that made you uh, and you add in the present some changes, some modifications. And that, that's how I understand the duration. So maybe the ones that are more knowledgeable in Berson's, Bersonian terms could help me with this. Another question, or can I can I speak a little bit? <laughs> no question. Okay. Yes, I think that the duration is not just connected with succession, with the fact that you have continuous succession of imprevisible events. Duration is also connected with memory. So, in a way, you are right, since uh, here you have a, a mutation is in heredity so it means you have a, some kind of memory here right so yes. i think that your your vision is is not wrong right. but uh, I, I will ju maybe just add one point uh, since you are um, dealing with molecular biology you are dealing with genes <laughs> you are genocentric as usual <laughs> and, and <laughs> not so much <laughs> not so much okay fine genocentric <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, you, you can show your presentation again, but uh, you see you have different level of regulations. Yeah. And so a level of regulation, including the environment, phenocopy and blah, blah, blah. blah. So, mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, it also means that you have different levels of memories, right? Yes. Okay. So in this yes. way, novelty is not just coming from the fact that you have mutation at the genetic level, but it's also coming from the fact that you have different level of memories intertwined, entangled. Yes, absolutely. And there's, so, a, there's currently and this concept. If you go in this way, you can make a nice comparison between Bergson and, and uh, contemporary biology. Good. <laughs> I, I think there's a subject which is the, the, the idea of niche construction, which is similar to- Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Another question? 
Nobody? I think there is Tano that wants ah, to. Ah, Tano, Tano. Hi, Hi Tano. Great. That's uh, the first Hello. time that I see you, so. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Nice to see you too. <laughs> um, okay. Thanks so much. It's just a quick question for um, Gregorio. Uh, on the topic of instinct, um, yeah, the question is just what you make of Bergson's theory of instinct since you are discussing it in the context of Rie's criticism of it and then moving into more general entomology. Of course, Bergson's theory of instinct can't really survive the Rieian criticism because for Bergson, instinct is asleep, right? It's perfectly fitted to its objects so that it doesn't have to represent it. It acts in a perfect way, which is why the wasp can know the anatomy of the caterpillar with such precision. Um, but this makes it completely uh, inflexible, right? So it can't adapt to changes in its objects. It can't be modulated by perceptual signals and so on and so forth. And this is what Rie points out. And he tries to sort of pull away from the, the, the asleep theory of instinct, the sonambulist theory of instinct towards one uh, for which instinct, you know, is receptive to um, environmental cues and sort of modulates and can recombine, uh, you know, according to selection pressures and so on and so forth. And then that gives you the rest of entomology quite nicely. But I think you have to leave Bergson behind maybe to get there. So I want to ask you sort of what, what you're doing by juggling these, these various um, theories and whether you think you can bring Bergson into entomology or whether you're just sort of using him as a departure point. Thanks. Hopefully that's clear enough. Thank you. Yeah, yes, of course. And yeah, one, one very important principle to hold is that of specificity of instinct uh, in comparison to intelligence. Another important principle is, uh, I, I don't think uh, Bergson is so much of a fixist as, uh, as uh, Fabre, for example, because what I tried to show is that um, he understands that uh, instinct changes uh, in a, in, with, through geological times um by comparing it uh, comparing it with um, formative organization uh, with uh, with instinct of the of a cell for example so all, all those passages before the scene of uh, the hunting wasp and the caterpillar are devoted to uh, these uh, this very important comparison and and to say that uh, life's life has different rhythms and I think he uh, uh, he understands that, and he's not so much of a, a fixist. Yeah. So, but I I don't know. It's just an idea. Thanks. Thank you. So, Mathilde. Oh, well, if there is no. No more question. I think we can take a break.